because imagine here you are a child and and your parents are punishing you and you feel like oh if i'm not perfect i don't deserve to be loved I've been able to partner with Mind Valley to present you guys free master classes between 60 and 90 minutes covering mind, body, soul, relationships, and conscious entrepreneurship. Taught by spiritual masters, yogis, spiritual thought leaders, and best selling authors. Just head over to nextlevelsoul.com forward slash free. like to welcome to the show, John Gray. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great. Happy to be with you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I've Your books have helped me along my, my life's journey, and I didn't even know how much I needed them until I got married. Uh- <laughs> That's true for a lot of people. You know, a lot of people who are single go, what do I need this for? And then you get married, you realize men and women are different sometimes. No, I remember when your book, Men, men Are From Mars, your legendary book, Men Are From Mars, uh, Women Are From Venus came out. And I remember I was, I don't know how old I was. I was probably in my 20s and I started reading it and it was very I mean, it just opened my eyes to so many things. So I did go in a bit more prepared for relationships, uh, but then really had to dig deeper in after <laughs> after you get into some serious relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Relationships bring up everything that we need to grow from. <laughs> no question. No question. Now, how did you begin this journey down the road of how did you come up with this concept the, and the idea of men are from Mars, women are from Venus? by the way? arguably one of the best titles for a, a self, a, you know, a nonfiction self-help book ever. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's unique about that book. And then I answer your question is it's not even so much focused on self-help, but just identifying how we misinterpret each other. Right. Exactly. You know, it's so much of, we have unrealistic expectations, but uh, kind of how I grew into that book was <laughs> as a kid, I never thought I'd be a relationship expert. I was just a regular kid growing up, get, getting high enjoying sex, all that fun stuff in the 60s as a teenager. And then uh, uh, after Woodstock, I just got so high, I crashed. I said, you know, must be another way. And um, the Beatles had just said that there is another way you can get high without uh, crashing. And that's by learning meditation. So I learned TM. Uh, I met Maharishi. Just when the Beatles left, I met him and stayed with him for nine years. Uh, He was a major mentor in my life. I was his personal assistant. I lived with him. I taught his teacher training programs. So he was a a big influence. They even had my poster. They did my brain, you know, back in the seventies, when we started doing research on the brain, they even had a poster they put up in all the centers, 3,600 centers with my picture and my my brain function showing meditation can put you in this state. So I'm basically a 50 year meditator. It's a big, big part of my life. And so I was a celibate monk during that time. I was just, I mimicked him, you know, it's like a master's degree is where you master something outside yourself. You know, bachelor's is kind of getting a, a, a an array of knowledge. And then some people go to master's. Okay. There's something I'm really drawn to. I want to become that. I really became him in a sense. And I could give you an answer to any question he would have. And then it was time for me to do my own thing. It was just a natural shift for my PhD, which is original thought. And that happened around 28 years for me and came out into the world and started having sex. I hadn't, hadn't had sex in nine years, didn't masturbate that whole time. Uh, a real a real monk doesn't masturbate and a real person who doesn't masturbate <laughs> That for a man, the semen actually starts coming out of your skin. I used to say when I sweat, it'd be the smell of semen, but it really is going into the brain. Uh, I guess I just uh, I was just looking online and just seeing a lot of uh, famous stars and celebrities other than your geniuses in the past uh, practice celibacy, chosen celibacy, not uh, I'd like to get laid and I'm not and I'm going online to have sex. That's a whole different thing, but actually learn to integrate um that life force energy and only share it when you're feeling a lot of love because then you don't get drained. Otherwise people are being drained all the time now. And so anyway, that was my journey. So when I started having sex, I, (laughs) at 29 years old, again, after nine years of chosen abstinence, the, the, uh, I had lots of girlfriends and I would say to them, look, I don't, I've been a monk, teach me what makes you happy in your body. And somehow that was very acceptable. And even, um, 
attractive to them. And they did. And I realized, gee, you know, I'd been having sex, but I didn't know all this stuff. Women were all different and they had different experiences and so forth. So I thought I'll just start teaching seminars on sex. That's how I started out because uh, we're very different when it comes to sex and then nobody disputes that, but then to keep the sex going, you have to have good communication. So then I became expert on communication and I became an expert in relationships. Ironically, it was the one thing my teacher Maharishi didn't teach. He never talked about relationships. And part of when you leave a cult, it's kind of a cult. Uh, you, a nice cult. It was a nice cult. A very nice cult. It's a nice cult. Not all these crazy ones. But still, as a teacher, they say that you're not allowed to teach TM if you leave the organization. So anyway, you know, you teach what you need to learn. And actually, I'm a master of meditation. So that wasn't really what I needed to learn. So I didn't teach it anymore. I thought, what else can I teach? And it turned out to be, ironically, everything he didn't teach. Uh, so I kind of had my you know, kind of like grew up in the shade of a big tree and I got planted somewhere else, can do my own thing. And uh, what, what TM does or meditation, different meditations people do, it does open up your creativity to solve problems. So I became a problem solver. Uh, the people take my seminars on sex and making love, then it turned into them wanting counseling from me. And uh, then I saw in counseling, the big problem was women didn't understand men at all. I mean, they didn't get us at all. And, and men certainly didn't understand women. And I, I grew in my understanding of women for men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Through about nine years, I sat in a room, counseled women eight hours a day. And literally people say, how can you say women are like this? I said, because eight hours a day, hundreds of women came through my office and they all had the same complaints about their husband. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you know, we all have our own unique differences, but when it comes to the things that bother us the most, anything that's bothering you is really misinterpreting reality. Uh, you know, now I'm 70 years old and happy guy, successful guy. And uh, I just don't get caught up in misinterpreting reality. Nothing bothers me really. Uh, and yet I still have passion. I still disagree with things. I, I, I try to avoid the heated debate about all the trans stuff. It's just like, <laughs> I just think it's going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to realize that men and women are very different. You can't really know your sexual identity till you're, you start knowing it when you go through puberty. You see, the big difference between men and women is that men have, uh, on a biological level, uh, in order to be stress-free, our testosterone levels have to be uh, 10 to 20 times higher than a woman's. Mm. And a woman's estrogen levels need to be 10 to 20 times higher than a man's. And certain things make estrogen, certain things make testosterone. But that doesn't show up till you're in puberty. For a boy at puberty, his testosterone goes up 10 times. And a girl, her estrogen level shoots up as well and starts having her period, her hormones. So we don't even know who we are in terms of our sexual identity. And I know that's the most controversial thing, but I just finished the whole talk. On it, so it's coming out of me. It's what's going on in the world today. All this discussion. Sure. Back when, back when I wrote Men Are From Mars, that was, that was the beginning of where the universities started saying nonsense things like um, all gender differences are just constructs of society and that men and women really aren't that uh, different at all. And I agree, you know, society defines us as men and women. I don't wear a dress. I mean, society... Yet, if you're in Scotland, men can wear dresses, you know, so that's society saying things. But most societies are actually, I would say all historically, they, they create a culture that particularly supports men in promotes and producing testosterone and a culture that promotes women in producing more estrogen. Because if women can't double their estrogen in the presence of a man, the species will die. Uh, to get pregnant, women's estrogen levels have to become 20 times higher than a man's. And so, you know, there's certain biological functions, evolutionary wise, uh, we created cultures that support well-being, because mm -hmm. if we look at the body, okay, we have this thing called stress hormones and stress hormones are great for short term, you know, running away from a tiger, that's great. But you have to be able to not be in the stress hormones all the time. So I looked at stress hormones and noticed that when men are having stress hormones, their testosterone levels are low and their estrogen levels are high. And when a woman uh, is experiencing stress, always her estrogen levels are low and her testosterone levels are high for her as a woman. And any man who's experiencing well-being, the average guy, when he's not stressed, his testosterone levels will be 10 to 20 times higher than the average happy woman. And a happy woman, 
her estrogen levels are 10 times more than a man's. And then they'll double when she's turned on. If a woman has an orgasm, it becomes uh, 20 times higher than a man's. So these are real simple things. This is not complicated stuff. You know, people say, you know, we need more research on it. Well, we always need more research on things, but nobody's ever looked at these very simple hormonal differences in terms of, in the context of how do you have better relationships? For example, if a woman is low estrogen, Basically, she's in a state of chronic stress all the time. And women are, you know, <laughs> it's a it's a big deal. What do these women do often to find relief is we have this huge industry in America called counseling. And that's how I learned this stuff. I'm counseling women all day long. And I learned that women didn't like me solving their problems. Once I started listening more, I had a waiting list for my therapy sessions. And then I started learning that if I can get women to cry, then they leave really happy. And what that is, is helping them experience their emotions, the vulnerable emotions that they don't share at work. And it turns out that when you share your vulnerable emotions that you don't share with anybody, uh, you're actually producing lots of estrogen. And that's very important for women. Otherwise, they can't get pregnant. And nature rewards you if you're still capable of spreading the species, you know, <laughs> evolution. Right, right, right. You know, let me and, let, let me ahead. let me ask you um because I have to ask uh, I've had a few people on the show who have been in the presence of Maharishi uh Maharishi uh, what was that experience like being in front of a ascended master like that for and and you I mean I've I've, I've talked to people I have people on the show you know eight weeks a couple of weeks here nine years I mean that's unheard of so what was that like it was magnificent. And my life now is more magnificent. But you see, one of the everybody has their, you know, if I was a, a pro basketball player, just throwing loops, hoops, I think it's called, uh, would be if he's really in the flow, it's ecstasy. Okay. Sure. So that's one way to experience ecstasy is being good at something. Well, I became really good at meditation. And to become really good at meditation means that. Uh, you become celibate. The, this life force energy goes up your spine and lights up your, your brain. I mean, it's, a, it's amazing. That's why all of your great yogis are all celibates. They're all celibates. Now, what I am, I'm still a great yogi. To, yesterday, I took the day off. I meditated 16 hours, okay? And I was oh in a state of, of meditative ecstasy. And I, I'm in that place all the time, but it's, uh, I'm still a celibate, although I've learned how to have sex uh, without ejaculating. See, okay. that, that's the, the, the very high yogic state uh, is you no longer have to transcend life. You go up to find your high self. Then you learn to bring your high self down into all of your energy centers. So you create success. You pay bills. You make money. You have sex. You raise children. You have grandkids. You live in the world, but you bring the divine into the world. So if we think of ourselves as humans, the human part of it is just a conditioned animal. Okay. Everything we do, we think we have free will. We don't until we make mistakes and suffer. And then we realize that our suffering is caused by us and nobody else. Then the divine comes in. That's the divine awareness is that we are responsible for creating our reality. So when I'm upset, I still get upset. It's part of being human. How quickly I come back to not only feeling good again, but feeling better and learning a lesson. See, all, all of our free will is is we're an amazing species, which is when we suffer, we can, we can say, oh, I can correct that and do, I can live differently. I can do different. I can talk to my wife differently. I can talk to myself differently. I can interpret reality differently. The ability to see things differently. That's why TM would teach about creative intelligence. Creative intelligence is to be able to look at something new instead of repetitive intelligence, create. So let me, let me create a way of looking at, uh, my wife's complaining about me and I'm getting mad at her. Uh, and then I'll react back like an animal. Why not think of a creative solution to not react back? Like, let's not talk about this right now. Let's focus on why I love you so much. And you can do that as a simple thing. If you stop yourself from escalating, you know how arguments start in relationships and just mm -hmm. rises up. As soon as you're escalating an argument, you're in a fight or flight state, men's testosterone levels are going down. This is, see, a lot of what I say is counterintuitive because it's opposite of the way people believe today. We're just going in the wrong direction of, of nonsense. When a man actually gets angry, he needs to stop talking. Kind of like what they would teach you in boot camp. If you're upset, stop talking. And what Buddha taught, if you're upset, stop talking, forget it. 
Now you apply that logic to a man. He mostly taught men that technique. If you're with your wife and she's upset, what do we instinctively do? We say things like, forget it. Don't worry about it. No problem. Hey, why get a, why, why bring this up again and again and again? You know, that's what we say because we don't need so much estrogen. When you talk about problems, you produce estrogen. <laughs> if somebody's listening to you and your stress level goes down and when your stress level goes down, you have no problems. Your brain then balances the problem, realizing it's not such a big deal. Now that's what women need. That's why we have an industry called therapy where 90% of the people who come to counseling are women. They just want to talk and complain basically. <laughs> Let me, so let me ask you this because I've, I've meditated probably the, my record is four hours, four and a half hours. Good for you. I, 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 I mean, I, I meditate every day, at least an hour to two a day. It was my goal. That's, fa that's fantastic. That's yeah. I, I try, I truly try to do that at minimum. And what do you, I've, I can't, I can't even comprehend where, what happens at a 16 hour meditation session. Well, it's different now than it was then. Now it's in those days I had to move. I my body would shake oh, okay. uh, cause it, cause it had certain blocks to the energy flowing through. So as long, you know, you'll see people, they're doing their little Joppa beats They keep doing something. Okay. That releases any where you have blocks for me. It was like, <laughs> it was just literally like this. Tigger, uh, <laughs> like Tigger. <laughs> for hours and hours and hours. And if you could imagine in a not, imagine when you're thrusting having sex, mm -hmm. is there any problem with the time? No, you don't really think about time at that moment. You either. don't think about time at all. So if you imagine the ecstasy, if I just go like this, there was ecstasy. And I would okay. go through what I now have identified as is basically 30, 34 levels, 32, 34 levels of different perspectives. Like here's a, a classic. If you read some spiritual books, you'll see, you'll see different enlightened type people will, will describe it differently. And that's because they're experiencing it a bit differently. So here's one classic one, which is you're meditating. You realize that the, the space around you is unlimited. That was just the most fun thing that I would call that my first real uh, awakening of enlightenment uh, that was at 28 but even at 24 i remember when i was meditating that that's when i used to meditate like an hour or two and i and you probably have had this experience the way i described it is my mind has found its resting place mm -hmm. yeah that's such a nice see when you're when your mind is just resting and, and you're completely rest, and then there's a flow okay then there's the flow and there's no time and the time stops you're in this kind of blissful. And I, I use the word bliss more than anything else. Ecstasy is a good vo word as well, but it doesn't really kind of grab, explain the feeling that you get. Like you walk out. But, but, but there are different levels. See, bliss is a level. Uh, uh -huh. uh, another level is ecstasy. Another level is um, softness, mm -hmm. a cloud-like feeling of just merging into softness. Mm -hmm. uh, all these different levels. And what they are is, you know, most people know about the seven energy centers. And Chakras, many right. people chakras so we're all born with certain energy centers that are that are um, more developed and others depend on others to develop that's why we're drawn we're attracted to other people because in that person's presence there's a connection that awakens that energy center that maybe is not so open uh you know this is i, I have this thing where uh, you know for years before i became really famous and everything the I would have these classes, always 32 people. It was like uh, each person had certain energy connections that would bring out the best in me as a teacher. So we're drawn to people that have channels, certain channels that are open, that help to open us through resonance. And we help to open them through resonance. It's kind of like some women, they just have a channel and you're turned on sexually to them. Others you're not turned on to, you know, it's just this, it's, it's, it's about the energetic fields connecting. And so meditation is when you create a channel between different chakras. So one of those channels would create bliss. One creates a softness. One creates a, 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 a just a peaceful unboundedness. Uh, this, my, my favorite, I can turn on any of these 34 levels and then I'm kind of in all of them at the same time, but the focus on one creates a distinct experience. And one of them is where you have this, this, presence that comes from behind you and just permeates through you. And there's no you. Uh, that, that's my, uh, when I listen to Ramana Maharshi talk about his experience, 
uh, that's one of the levels, you know, they're, they're all different levels. I can relate to anybody's spiritual experience. You can then see what energy channels are open for that person. And TM awakens mainly what people experience during the TM technique is that certain people were drawn to that because Maharishi would, his resonating with him would, would, would help you experience bliss. And then, you know, I remember it was like some kind of cosmic shift on the planet. He called it the dawn of the age of enlightenment. But we'd have these classes where there'd be like a uh, thousand people, two thousand people. And we'd be in all these hotels and we'd all be meditating all day, doing yoga, then meditating and yoga and meditating. And it was like I was like uh, the, the second that were, who really started to have like real profound unbounded awareness. I mean, literally you walk around, you're just, there's no limits to your consciousness. It's just infinite out there. <laughs> it's an amazing experience. It was just blew me away. Now that, that lessens when you're now bringing that unboundedness into this body uh, and opening up other centers, but that's one which TM did a lot. So you hear a lot of TM meditators and it was like uh, this other guy did it that around the same week I started happening to me and they started having another one. And then it was like a, a thousand people were all experiencing unbounded awareness. That's free consciousness, no limits to it. Then the, after a while, about a year or two of that, I remember feeling there's this unbounded awareness, but I want to be that unbounded awareness. So I want to be that. So then that becomes another spiritual experience where I am that as opposed to just I'm experiencing unbounded awareness. And then, but there's a joy in that. Each level has its own amazing joy. And then there's, I am that. And once you are that, <laughs> then there's another, another experience to that, uh, which is that's all, it's all inside of me. It's all inside of me. And the only other time I had that experience is I was on ayahuasca. And it was like the whole forest and all the animals are all inside of me. The noises were in me because it's all within me. You became one with your surroundings. Yeah. The, no, that's I am that. But that I am is different. Oh, okay. It's, it's, it's a different experience of I'm one with everything around me. Right. <laughs> In other words, everything around me is inside of me as me. <laughs> and then, then you realize that's sort of the dissolution of the ego, which is it is it if I'm that, but that's in me, then I am then who am I that I am that over there that I am? So, so that's another one of these classic phrases, I am that I am, that you can wonder about until you experience it. And it's amazing experience because once I'm that, which is all, uh, then there's no me. So you kind of wonder, who am I? And that's a whole nother Hindu teaching where they would practice neti neti, which is I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this. I remember Rajneesh had a fun exercise where you imagine you've died and mm -hmm. you're gone and everybody's at your funeral, you know, and, and I used to put that in my seminars a long time ago. Uh, that's a fun experience of, of not, not being, except when, it, when I'm not that, because I'm that, and then that I am, I am that I am, then suddenly, well, who am I? That's your, the awareness of your awareness of something. Okay, so right. it's uh, awareness of awareness is a little bit like that, but it's a bit more profound. So once you have, I'm not, I'm not this individual ego now, because what am I then? I, this is this body and whatever, and sure. it's all one. one. Then you, you connect with source. And it's, you know, when somebody's being creative and they're writing something or you're you're making a movie and all that, you're actually you're right there at source. OK, it's just pouring out. It's just, you know, the flow you're in it. And that's a state. And then there's there's that. And then there's a total surrender that happens where you realize that, you know, the, the source is doing everything for you, particularly when you're in touch with you're dependent on that. So it's no longer I'm doing it. I'm dependent on that. And I remember for me, always I'm one of these people who's. Uh, the first time I do something, it's like I do it really well. And, and, and that's because I was more in touch with source. I've been doing yoga since I was three years old. And as a child, I used to at least sit 20 minutes in, next to the heater every morning. And I, what I didn't know then is I was going into meditative trance. So my yes, part of my family, you know, if you were an actor, you had actors who were parents. They'd be actors. You sort of pass on the lineage. My mother was the... You know, my dad taught me yoga at three years old, you know, all doing yoga, the family. And my this is in Houston, Texas. <laughs> you know, this is like they're way into the spiritual world. And my mother had an esoteric bookstore. Uh, wow. you know, and she never advertised. It's just she had so many books in her own library that 
she eventually said, I'm going to buy a house and just rent out, uh, not rent out, just loan out my books. And eventually people wanted to buy books and it became the biggest esoteric spiritual bookstore in the country. They had to add another wing to the house. They did it. They just had a little tiny sign. That was it. It's pretty much what I do. Uh, <laughs> I don't do, people always ask me for marketing skills or, you know, I just take the calls. That's all I do. <laughs> just, you know, it's kind of a bit like that law of attraction thing that everybody has got on for a little while. I'm actually in that movie called The Secret. They cut me down to like only like one tenth of what I had to say, because mm -hmm. it's not just about uh, attracting what's going on inside you have to learn how to process all the subconscious thoughts that says it's not going to happen you know people say oh i just think positive you could just be denying emotions and denying your doubts and denying your fears and then you kind of go why has not happened yet well because you haven't processed all the obstacles within your being to having all that come into your life and it's you know, a success is tough. You know, you look at all these six. I know that sounds terrible for people who aren't that successful, but what happens is look at movie stars and how mm -hmm. crazy their lives are. Look at rich people, how often mm -hmm. crazy their families are, you know, right. in a sense in Hollywood, you're not a star until you've gone through rehab. Okay? Right. It's like a, it's like a path, a path you have you know, to walk. To, but what that is, if you have to understand going to rehab meant your life was really, really awful and bad. And people don't understand that because the more safe you are to be yourself. Okay. Now, once you have some achievement, like success, people trust you, they appreciate you. you feel, oh, I can be me. I'm so great. I can be me. Then, then basically everything that's unlike you comes out of you. So you see that, you know, <laughs> they're like a bunch of spoiled kids. Same thing happens in marriage. Well, you know, when you start taking your clothes off with somebody, when was the time when you're growing up where you took your clothes off all the time? You're a baby. Uh, so people all get all gooey and baby-like and your love is so beautiful. You feel that that's all this essence of who we are when we came in. But can we handle all of the suppressed and repressed emotions and experiences that and belief systems that are limited that formed at that time? If you look at the first seven years of life, uh, researchers say that you're basically all the time in a dream state. You're producing theta brain waves, and theta is what we're producing in uh, hypnosis or in, or in dream. And so we're constantly being hypnotized. Our whole self-esteem as we start out is based upon our parents and their heritage and their experience. And then we sort of work these things out if we start becoming self-aware and conscious that we can say, okay, if I'm feeling angry, well, why am I feeling angry? How am I misinterpreting reality? And how can I shift out of that? Just noticing it isn't enough. You have to have technology and skills. And these skills are not really known that much through history because there was an old saying about Pandora's box. You know, you've heard of Pandora's box, right? Of course. So, so Pandora's box is desire. Uh, you keep your, des as long as you don't have personal desire and you're more of a community collective, you don't have a me. Because as soon as you have personal desire, then, then you have passion. And if you don't get what you want, then you're passionately negative. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's the demons that come out as soon as you start having self-esteem and you start looking at what do I want. And so cultures, to a great extent, have pushed down people from what do you want? What do you want? As opposed to a collective. It's the family. You respect the parents. You respect society. You give your life to your country. You know, all that, that thinking. And then you've got Buddhism over here saying, for some people would interpret it to be give up desire when really he was saying give up attachment to desire, but it was minimizing desire because, you know, if you analyze some content people in life, they don't, they're happy with what they got. They don't desire more. And what happens, it's kind of like a man when he retires, he stops wanting and, and his testosterone goes down. He dies within three years. Once he retires, that's what the statistics show life insurance policies. So, now, the, so with desire, John, when when we the concept, I love the, the concept that you're talking about. That you know, we, are you saying that we as a species or as people, eventually, like the ascended masters, the 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 yogis of the world, the, the, these these people, do they just think of themselves completely connected? That we are all one, as opposed to an individual person that's like separate from everybody else okay i think i think of it like that I, I you just talk about it happens for me it's just where i put my attention there's one one part if when you're, when you're in the source you're one with all right 
But the experience of one with all is there's no one. <laughs> it's hard to describe these things. Right, you're 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 part of you're part of source. It's just, so it's just what is, and there's an awareness of what is, and so according if we go to the source, you and me are the same. But I see you completely different, and I'm completely different because I also am uh, integrated. That I, I'm also an individual. A uh, easy way to say it is like there's a big ocean, yeah, and you're a wave, and I'm a wave, and we're all made out of the same thing. If you go back to Maharishi's teaching, TM, which is a great beginner's technique for everybody, and maybe some people do it the rest of their lives. With uh, with Maharishi used to take these flowers. And he would look, see the little petals, the green petals and the white uh, flower and the, the, the green stem. If you go a little in, you'll find the sap. And even though it turns white here, it's still sap. And even though it's green here, it's still sap. So that's the, the unmanifested state of life. So the source is a one source, one ocean. And, and part of enlightenment is to recognize that you are one with the ocean and you're a wave on the ocean. And you are... So, the ocean it's like taking two yeah, bottles yeah. of water out of the ocean you're separate but you're both water but yeah, you're, separate you're in a bottle you're in a bottle and you know i'm the ocean uh, i'm a little piece of the ocean right That's but really but then the, the the insanity is that like i'm the bottle <laughs> the insanity is i'm the bottle and also there's another insanity that i'm the ocean right <laughs> okay that there's a another saint in india i like talking about my experiences in india i've been there yeah. like a lot a lot but yeah. another saint mayor baba is quite famous yeah and, and he he used to have to beat himself every day uh just to uh what what would he do he, he <laughs> can't remember exactly now it's going back too far with with mayor baba but mayor baba went around to mental hospitals and he said half the people in mental hospitals are all god realized and that they think that they're one with that they think they're God. Okay. Mm. There's so many Jesus is in the mental hospitals. Okay. And the Buddha's in the mental hospital, but see, they have this experience and they no longer hold it in a bottle, but they think they're the ocean. And, and part of being logical and reasonable and living in this world is, yeah, I'm one with the ocean, but I, I can't even lift more than 150 pounds. Okay. So, and uh, I have all these human traits and, and we are human. The human part of us is, is a part of us, there's an old saying, which is to err, to make mistakes is human. And then add to that, and to be divine is to learn from those mistakes and change your ways, change your way of thinking, change your way of behaving. behaving. And oh, what's happening in the world today is we're, we're going through a little regression. It's greater mm-hmm. freedom. See, this was the 60s, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what's in my book, uh, which I think for relationships yes. called here Beyond Mars and Venus. Mm-hmm. Because uh, what's happened in the world today is dramatic changes, and it started after World War II. And World War II was a, supposed to be the, uh, the, war, the war that ended all the wars. wars right? okay? And so what you saw in the 50s and then into the 60s was freedom, more freedom. When you have more freedom than anything which is suppressed inside of you comes out. OK, that, there's just that's why you see people who get uh, lottery tickets. Or they win the lottery. <laughs> They're really happy for a while. Then they go right back to the unhappiness that they had before. Uh, it's literally when you feel I'm safe, I can be myself and every part of you that you push down to be yourself comes out. Uh, so that's looks like that's what all therapy is about is to look at all of our conditioned reactivity comes from unprocessed experiences from childhood. Because imagine here you are a child and, and your parents are punishing you and you feel like, oh, if I'm not perfect, I don't deserve to be loved. A big misconception. Uh, we're all imperfect and we all deserve to be loved. But we have to learn how to uh, learn from our imperfections and continue to grow. So it's a real simple thing. And a child doesn't know who they are. Uh, we all come into this world pure with love and, 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 and openness and uh, mainly just open and loving, put it that way. Joyful, joyful, mm-hmm. hopeful. You know, it's a, a wave of positivity. And But who, do, who, are, who am I to deserve that? We look in a mirror, just like today I had to look in the mirror and brush my hair. Uh, how do I know who I am? It's how I'm treated or how I'm seen by others. So if I'm being punished, a simple basic thing is then, then oh, well, I was, um, I was imperfect. And so I, if I'm imperfect, I don't deserve to be loved. I deserve to be punished. I deserve to suffer. Mm-hmm. I, I don't get to do. And, and 
how to change that conditioning so that when you make mistakes, here I'm an adult, I make a mistake. Um, okay, learn my lesson and let it go. Instead of holding it on, you see, we tend to hold on, hold on. And some people, they make, they're so lacking love that when they make a mistake, they won't admit they made a mistake because they're so deep down inside afraid that if somebody found out I made a mistake, I would lose love. And so, so we have a lot that all, you know, it's a whole world of psychology and our suppressed feeling and all that. So when I hit these high levels of enlightenment, all that stuff came, came up and that's called dark night of the soul. That's another stage of enlightenment is this stuff comes up and you have to, it's like crazy stuff. It's, it's uh, you have to uh, tame your arrogance. You have to tame your outrageousness. You know, this kind of a cliche of these, these, uh, big stars, they have such big egos and you have to give them some l- little latitude because <laughs> everybody's saying yes to them all the time, you know? So mm-hmm. it's like, uh, and, and so they, they become very impatient. They become very irritable. They get depressed. They want to take drugs to avoid all the feelings. And then, uh, you know, I do all the meditation stuff. And for me, I then went to China where my ideas are continuing to blossom. Uh, China has no problem saying men and women are different. America, I was canceled in America in 2000. <laughs> you know, wow. I am the ultimate sexist in the idea of universities. You know, one of my daughters went to Berkeley and in her social studies, the teacher was holding up my book, you know, saying this is the sexism because Men Are From Mars was the number one best selling book of all books in the in the 90s. And mm-hmm, my daughter was, was in Berkeley and the teachers, you know, dissing my book and quoting me. And my daughter there just said, you know, I know the author of that book. And uh, I don't think he's ever said that. I know he wouldn't think what you just said. Uh, Have you actually read that book? And the teacher, to her credit, she said, no. (laughs) You see, just to say men and women are from different planets means you're a sexist, as opposed to Mm. what I sincerely want to do is help us understand our differences in a positive way. Because if we don't understand our differences in a positive way, then when they show up, men think women are crazy and women think men are narcissists. That's what's happening today. So <laughs> what are the what are the biggest differences between men and women in the way we communicate with each other? OK, if it, now you, to, we're, we're talking two time periods. OK, so let's talk a little about men from Mars. And usually people relate to this when they have children, because in the old days, people used to have, you get married and have kids. Right. So as soon as you're getting married, you have kids. You've made a commitment. Your heart is open. First of all, you're getting naked with somebody. That means all your conditioning is going to come up because it brings back all the childlike emotions of fear. You know, children are crying all the time. You know, they're they're laughing and they're crying and they're you know, it's all. That's a lot of emotional pain of feeling nobody hears me. Nobody's there for me. Uh, I have no power. I can't get out of this crib. You know, these are all repressed emotions and they don't show up until you feel more mature and self-esteem and more in control of my life. Then the feelings of out of control, powerlessness uh, start to come up and even betrayal, you know, such a big deal about how my partner betrayed me. We make such a big deal out of betrayal. Well, a child has that emotion (laughs) because one day we're happy and attentive to the child. We begin to think, oh, everybody loves me. And then one day you're having a bad day and I'm being ignored. I've just been betrayed. Uh, this is the way, way couples are, you know, as a couple, they spend time together. Man's attentive to her. She's loving him. He's loving her. And then he needs to go to his cave. Okay. That's a very popular phrase of men are from Mars. Now we have man cave and all these things that became part of our culture. This is like really important for women to understand that for men, when they get really close, they need to pull away. And I talked about that, like the rubber band theory. I said in Men From Mars, men, they get really close to women. And at a certain point, they just need to back off, find themselves again. Oh, they don't, they're not thinking, by, find myself again. They're just thinking, I need to be do my own thing. I can't just be with her all the time. And women shame us for that if they don't understand this. Because connection, when you're together and you're sharing and all that, connection increases estrogen. Being alone increases testosterone. Feeling independent increases testosterone. So now, biologically, people didn't understand hormones a long time ago. They just understood that, hey, he needs to go off and do his thing. Don't take it so personally. But today, (laughs) we all think we're supposed to be the same. And it was sort of built into a a marriage even because the man was the provider. So he would go away because he loved her. 
Think mm-hmm. about that. I'm going away to do my job because I love you. And a woman's going, sure, he loves me because he's going away. But now we have a society where we don't need men to go out and make the money. They're out there making the money too. So now they're both going away. <laughs> right. And, and connection, she's not getting the connection she needs. And we see that by women's hormonal imbalance today. You know, I was just having a debate with some woman talking about, you know, there's no sexes. And I, and she said, I know all about hormones. I couldn't have children. <laughs> I had to have four years of hormone injection. I said, you know, people don't really need to take hormones if they're healthy. Women are designed to make babies. I remember... Uh, one time with Connie Chung did an interview with me. She was this uh, big interviewer. And, sure, I know. Uh, and she was ferocious, feminist, right? And and I also I knew her husband. I'd seen him put his hands on the women back in, backstage. So clearly they didn't have a monogamous relationship. And clearly she was a workaholic and, uh, and, and not a happy woman, clearly. And so I, she wanted to interview me at one of the heights of my success invite me to New York. And I knew Connie. I said, I'm not going to walk into somebody who's so negative. And so I said, okay, I'll do an interview, but you have to come to California. And so then they called back and they said, okay, we'll meet halfway <laughs> in Chicago. And she interviewed me for three hours. It was, it's one of these typical things, a hit piece. Okay. First, sure. the first hour was really sweet. Next two hours was just hit piece, hit piece, hit piece, hit piece, questioning everything I say again and again and again. Fortunately, I was trained. I'd learned through experience how to deal with this because this is such a a controversial subject. I had to learn to keep my cool. All right. If you lose your cool, you're you're not always trusted. And she was sitting in a director's chair, you know, that sort of elevated up on a director. And I'm on my director's chair. And then she started after all these sweet things, she said, she started saying things like, oh, your mother must have uh, thought you really exaggerate things. And I said, no, I think my mother thought I had a lot of confidence. (laughs) And, and, you know, she'd say, well, you're not really a man's man, are you? I said, actually, I'm a stud and I love basketball. (laughs) So, (laughs) but, you know, these sort of things that get at me. And then she would throw in this one question she did like 10 times. Who are these blonde bimbos who just want to talk about their feelings when they get home? (laughs) And I, this is where she fell out of her chair and she fell out of her chair three times in this interview. She was so frustrated with me because I kept my cool. Who are these blonde bimbos? And I said, well, Connie, they're not like you. They're not workaholics. And they're, they really care about having a family. <laughs> <laughs> See, what they do is they, they rally you up and then they'll take like a minute, uh, 30 seconds out of this and 30 seconds out of sure. that. And so she kept doing that one, kept getting more frustrated with that and, but anyway, that was actually the thing that was in the show, which is uh, uh, women. So you say women need to talk about their feelings. She didn't say blonde bimbos, but she said, so women have to talk about. And you say they need to talk. You don't need they don't have to have solutions. See, that was a foreign concept to her. She's so I'm into solving problems. And and back and I have to say, this is back in the 90s. Almost all women knew that they needed to talk and their partners weren't good listeners. You won't see that today. Uh, women basically come home from work and often don't need to talk. They're so masculine. Mm. And you see, they've lost the connection to their femininity. They don't have the experience of talking about what's going on, having someone listen. It's not all our fault. It's also men don't know how to listen. Uh, We'll listen a little bit and say, oh, don't worry about that. Oh, forget that. No big deal. Uh, Which just makes it not safe for her to express what she's feeling. And, and how to validate her feelings. Yeah, it was a big word back in the 90s. I want my feelings to be validated. Uh, you don't even hear that that much now, but that's really what we need to do. And there's a real problem there because how do you validate somebody who is um, saying, you know, it's, it's difficult to walk in high heel shoes? You, you really kind of think, well, just don't wear high heel shoes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if uh, I know for me, looks has never been that important to me. Uh, how I look, not a big deal. It's what I do. And what men often don't realize how important it is to say things like, honey, you look so beautiful. And, and remember how you looked at her in the beginning and look at her that way. Oh, that, that dress looks great on you. You look you're so beautiful tonight. See, these are like little things to say that you don't instant instinctively come up with. But when you start doing it and seeing that it makes her happy, then you actually start believing it and noticing it. Uh, for example, 
I'd go on walks with my wife and she's really very feminine. And she looks at little flowers. She, oh, look at that little flower. And look at, I would never seen those flowers. You know, I'm, I'm right. going to my goal, you know? And, and I told her, it's so nice to be with you. It's like, you bring color into my life. You know, I'm so focused on achieving and whatever. And, and that's not all men. It's uh, what it is. It has a lot to do with the balance of masculine and feminine energy in your body. And what's happening today is a crisis and that the balance has swayed in the wrong direction. Men have gone to their female side, but they can't get back to the male. Mm-hmm. So, you know, here I'm very masculine. I work hard. I do the, I'm very feminine. I'm very soft and tender and love. <laughs> I got it both. That's, that's what our souls are wanting is to incarnate the spirit, which is both masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. left hemisphere, right hemisphere, testosterone, estrogen. And they're not equal in terms of the same. It's finding the right balance for you. And so if I put myself, uh, if I'm playing tennis, I'm going to make, I'm going to make testosterone competition. It makes testosterone. If I'm getting a massage, someone doing something for me, uh, estrogen goes up. These are like, you know, I've got huge lists in this book of circumstances and situations that attitudes and behaviors and circumstances and relationships that will stimulate the hormone your body needs most. And if it's a man today, the hormone men need most is more testosterone. Well, let me, more testosterone. well let me ask you a question. I heard you in another interview say that if you inject testosterone um, or inject estrogen for women, it does something, but it doesn't protect you against heart disease for men and things like that. Can yeah. you explain that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So better to make it than to take it. And the fact that you need to take it means you're out of balance. You're just out of balance. There's so many ways for a woman to produce estrogen. And one of those ways, for example, is therapy. Not that I'm promoting my business, but Mm -hmm. therapy has become huge. And 90% of the people who go to therapists are women. Why? Because they sit there and they talk and they talk and they get addicted to it. I'm not in favor of all kinds of therapy. Uh, I will listen to validate. And then I will point out to a woman that she's responsible for everything that happened to her. Mm. If you, t- if you just indulge people into their emotions, uh, validate, yeah, you're a victim. Yeah. You're a victim. Yeah. You were a victim. Now, what do you, how did you contribute to that? So you can change. See everything about being human is learning to become aware of our imperfections and then learning from that and changing, pivoting, doing something new and different. And out of compassion, I mean, you have to say, nobody knows how to do this today because we're in a different world. If you're a man and you're upset with your wife, generally you get in an argument and it escalates, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so what the new rule is, as soon as you start to escalate, you say to your partner, let's not talk about this now. And let's talk, let's focus on what we're grateful for. That sounds so fake. And woo woo, right. And woo woo. But it is what works. It, what, what, what's crazy is if you're angry to talk, because what happens when men are angry and they talk, they get mm-hmm. angrier and angrier. And what's happening biologically is his testosterone's going down, his estrogen's going up, he's going into hormonal imbalance. When he goes into hormonal imbalance, blood flow stops to the human part of his brain. And he's reacting based upon the conditioning of his childhood, of his ancestors, all the way back to monkeys. Even raising your voice is a monkey trait. Monkeys cannot communicate. So they talk about the importance of something. This hurts. Well, you didn't change. So this hurts. See, it gets higher and higher and higher. This is all primitive conditioning. We need to recognize when we're animals and stop being animals. And so when are you most a human is when you're feeling grateful, right? When you're feeling happy, when you're feeling hopeful, when you're feeling pride, all these things is who you really are. And life triggers us to go back into the conditioning of a child or all the way back to being a monkey, a survival instinct coming out. We have to regulate that. So I, cause like you said, it's woo woo. So now I'm playfully saying, if you want your relationship to be better, besides reading my books, join the John Gray cult for three months. That's it. I don't want you anymore. See cult leaders want to take over your life, take your money. No, just give me three months to change your brain. Okay. Because right now, if you escalate in a, in a relationship, argue back and forth. Why are you right? Ra- why is your temper going up? Because you're using it to intimidate the other person to push your point on them. Mm-hmm. 
So, and why do women complain so much? Well, they complain when they do, not all women complain so much, but, but when they do complain, why they complain? They want you to change. A loving relationship does not demand change for you to be happy. A loving relationship allows you to experience greater happiness when you're with your partner. So if you're blaming your partner, you need to get a life. Life gives us our foundation. Then we look to our partner to become happier. And so then what happens? We, we're not, we, we blame our partners for things. We complain about it. And then, then it escalates. What does it escalate? Talking. Don't men should not talk if they're, if they're angry or upset. Don't talk. Don't talk. As soon as you put it into words, estrogen levels are going up and testosterone is going down. This is a simple rule. Now, any therapist today, almost any therapist was, no, no, this is a safe place to talk about it. I remember in the beginning of my marriage with Bonnie, we were married for 34 years. She passed four years ago. Well, we went to counseling at one point and just made it worse. You know why I made it worse? It, there, how do you, what are your complaints? What do you feel, Bonnie? And we all listened to that. And then, okay, John, what do you feel when she says that? I said, I better not say what I feel when she says that. <laughs> I'm escalating. Oh, no. and, and then he says, but it, this is a safe place to talk. I said, okay, okay. Well, I think she's full of it. That didn't happen at all. She's overreacting to the. <laughs> and then my wife goes, see, see, that's what he does at home and walks out of the room. Okay. This, this is like child's play. You don't encourage somebody to express negativity at their partner. So what I do in couples counseling is at first I have to see him alone <laughs> till I train them to see how they ruin their relationship. Because we always, as a child, we only see as a monkey, it's always somebody else's fault. That's how you know you're in your monkey self when your unhappiness is due to somebody else. Now, somebody can hit me. Yes, this bruise came from them, but I can be, I can let it go. My body can heal. And I'm not walking around going, gee, I've been bruised. I've been bruised. I've been bruised. I've been bruised. You know, and the way that looks in marriages today, which is just so sad. Well, I still can't trust him. It's it's 10 years later. He had that affair. I just can't trust him. Are you kidding? He stayed with you after you roasted him over the coals. You know, there's so much extreme at all or nothing and demands for perfection, never letting go of the past, holding on to things in the past, learning how to be in present time. Meditation helps that, but it doesn't do it all. After I hit a real high level of enlightenment at, at 20, 20, 28, something like that, that's when all the attraction to my guru went away. Literally, I could do better than him. Uh, he, he, what, what I was looking for in there was in me. And so it was like a letting go that happened. I didn't know what was happening to me. All I knew is that I just time to go because I was a total devotee. Basically, I absorbed him and was a good guy, but not me, so to speak. I let him sort of be the uh, the father in my life is kind of like that. Mm -hmm. And and again, what's missing today, and particularly in the black community where we see so much violence, what's missing is no fathers. None of those mm -hmm. guys have fathers. Uh, they need role models and they need mothers who love fathers. How can you feel loved as a male growing up if your mother doesn't love a man? Not you well, as a child. Well, let me ask you a question. There's so much stuff happening in the world today. I mean, I feel like the whole world is going through this massive shift between climate change, between political issues, between the pandemic and now this war, you know, on the verge of World War Three. What do you believe is happening to to the world? I mean, you've been around a few a few a few blocks, a few years. You've been around yeah, the block yeah, a few I'm times. Seven, I'm 70 years old. I've been watching the whole thing and I've yeah. it's the loss of self. Okay, now think about what we and you talk about spirituality, Alex, is mm -hmm. it's finding yourself in others. It's that unity experience, right? Mm -hmm. I'm different from you, but I also have you in me. See, that's what that's what sex is, basically, is that when you're this guy and you're on your male side, you get horny, you want to go into a woman with love. And by going into someone different from you, different polarity from you. You feel ecstasy, you feel joy, you feel happiness, you feel pleasure by going somewhere else out of you. Okay, this is what a relationship is a teacher for us, is that I'm interacting with my wife and she'll say things that bother me. I need to take time to go in and validate that and to do it, to validate her difference. She's different from me. Okay, she likes order. I like mess. 
but I, I'm drawn to her because she cleans up messes. So, I, but I'm a messy guy, right? And I didn't realize how messy I was until until Bonnie died. Uh, now it's left to my own devices. <laughs> I was just a mess. And so, so I'm drawn to her because there's this sense of order and cleanliness and beauty that she has. And I just was not in touch with inside myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm drawn to her. She has a quality that I want to find within myself. And so by overcoming challenges and, and arguments and whatever, where the differences show up, resolving them is finding the good and what her perspective is within myself. Okay. So when you don't have a self, when your heart is not open, you can't find the good in what others say. So you polarize, you know, we got half the country thinking one way and hating those and these other ones thinking they're stupid. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's just, it's because people don't have the capacity of an adult, which is capable of holding opposites simultaneously. I can hear what you have to say without becoming offended. I can hear what you have to say. I can consider it. I can think about it. I can find a part of me that if I was in your shoes, I'd feel that way too. See, that's what men are from Mars, women are from Venus is all about. I'm just teaching men. I mean, they say, you got to understand, look at our culture. Here's a little example. Let me give some little examples. You go to the airport, what you'll see is pictures of partially naked women on all the covers of the magazines. Okay, mm -hmm. this is what's sexy. This is what's desirable. This is what gets front page is if you have one body type. And that's considered beauty and wrinkles and age, not considered beauty. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, guys, you get older, your hair goes gray. You're more trustworthy. You know, you got some wisdom on you. You're getting older is more powerful for men. Right. Having a young body is more powerful for women. And then it's a downhill after that. So what I have to do is be conscious of the conditioning that our culture puts in her into that she's not desirable as she gets older. And you have to counter that by every day. Oh, I give my wife four hugs a day. I look so beautiful tonight. Let's dress up, create opportunities where I'll dress up so she can wear some pretty clothes that makes her feel more beautiful because her body alone isn't as beautiful as it used to be, according to our cultural standards and so forth. Having a great sex life is important for women to be orgasmic, you know, when a woman's not having a regular orgasm, really hard to have self-esteem. And then she goes over to her male side and says, yes, I have self-esteem. I'm, I can do this. I can do this. And I can do this. And yeah. And she can't sleep at night. She's on antidepressants and she's, you know, having all kinds of psychological issues. She's not happy. And of course she blames her unhappiness. Well, if my husband did this and he did this and he did this, then I would be happy. No, you're just not happy. You have to wake up and realize enlightenment is recognizing you're in charge of your emotional responses. You can't change everything in the world the way you want it right now. But when your heart's open, what you find is amazing ability to love, which says you're not perfect, <laughs> but you try. That's one time I was at an audience of 7,000 people and everybody... You know, if I have a big audience, then I'm going to sign books for five hours, right? So I give a one and a half hour talk, five hours, pictures, signing books. And this is one event where Bonnie was there. And I, it's just a disaster for her because while I'm signing books, they all go up to my wife and say, oh, what's it like to be married to John Gray? <laughs> it must be perfection. <laughs> he says that perfection, you know, so. So, oh, and, oh and, she must got wild up for, after five hours. Of oh, I'll tell you, it's just horrible for her, you know, answering the same question, even, but that one, the boy. And, and uh, anyway, so I said, listen, I, I told everybody, don't ask my wife to question what's it like <laughs> to be married to John Gray. <laughs> okay. And don't tell her she's so lucky, please. He's lucky to be, I'm lucky to find her. All right. So, so I want to bring her on stage and she's not a stage person. You know, she, I'm, I love audiences. She's not, she's more personal opposites attracting. Then she, I, she agreed. I said, honey, would you come up? You don't have to, but would you answer those questions once? And then you have to hear them again. She laughed. So she come up on stage. I said, so what's it like to be married to me to answer that question? She says, I love you. Okay. And I said, honey, I think they want more words than that. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, so if you can flush that out a little bit, I think they'll feel like they got their question answered. And what's it like to be married to me? And she said, he really tries. <laughs> and I said, Ben, you have to get it. I, my wife loves me. I have a great sex life. We have harmony. And all I have to do is try. 
You just have to try. Now, I would add to that intelligently try, but, you know, don't give up. So if you're if what you're if you feel like it's impossible, realize you don't know what you're doing and find somebody who knows what they're doing and learn from them. That's what we have to wake up to is everybody needs to have somebody who knows more than you and about a place where you're not that great. And today uh, we're really not that great in relationships at all. It's a very, very unhappy world today. And biologically, we're in a very unhappy world. We're looking at men's testosterone levels on the whole order, 20% lower than where they would have been 20 years ago. 20% lower. Now, why I say testosterone is so important for men is that you can measure how stressed a man is by the balance of his testosterone estrogen. And I say that not because a lot of studies saying that, but the studies say that when a man is stressed, his testosterone levels are low. And the studies say that when you're emotional, your estrogen levels are going high. So so basically, when a man is angry, his testosterone is going down because he's in fear. You know, anger is fear. If you say to an angry guy, the lack of emotional intelligence is another thing I talk about. But the gender intelligence, you make quick changes. It's quite amazing. Emotional intelligence takes a little longer. If you're angry, you're not just angry, you're also disappointed and you're also afraid. If you're if you're not afraid, you're like uh, the world is your oyster. You're cool, calm and collected. You're patient. You know, we become irritable and patient, demanding because we don't trust that we're going to get what we want. And the only way you get what you want is to let go of your desperateness and your neediness and your negativity and demanding. Meditation teaches us how to pivot, but it doesn't help us to identify emotional intelligence or gender intelligence doesn't allow us to understand what what our reactions are instead of denying reactions in a sense i spent nine years in bliss denying all negative emotions i could do that because i was not out in the world having to earn money i'm a monk right so it's an easy life uh, if you can enjoy meditation <laughs> <laughs> and fasting and and other things, you know, I would fast. That's a discipline. Discipline increases testosterone. Uh, hard work, for, and it is hard work in the beginning. You know, you talked about it. it's hard to meditate more than an hour. I get it. Uh, and now it's I can go for unlimited amount of time, but my back does get sore, and you know I start to bend over. So I have a solution for that. I sit in my bathtub for hours and hours, and ironically, I don't wrinkle up. Uh, is quite very cool. So the water just gives me a little more support so I can just stay in this amazing state. Blissful and, some, state. And, and somebody says, you know, what's the point of that? Well, the point of that, at least for me, that's that, that's my chosen vocation, is helping the world by bringing in more light and love. Uh, I am one with the collective mind. And when when I am cleansing out my collective mind on a very practical level, it's helping the world and it helps the world by I get to do my talks, I do this, and I come from a place which is grounded and anchored into source consciousness. And when you're anchored in a source consciousness, you just have a good effect on people. People can begin to see things differently. And in terms of the Maharishi's teaching, you have creative intelligence. Creative intelligence is not repeating what you learned as a child it's, it's, and, and what's going on in the collective mind you're going out of the collective mind and you come back in. Einstein talked about this concept of collective consciousness. And when you transcend the collective consciousness, you step out and in order to take another perspective. And then you bring that back in and you apply it in some way. And anybody who can step out, that's a good thing to do for the world is to keep stepping out to bring in more And then what happens is when you bring into the world, it brings you down. People don't realize this is, you know, they put Jesus on a cross. You know, the guy was bleeding and in pain. Okay, so just because you're spiritually enlightened doesn't mean good things are happening all the time. Uh, True. Very true. (laughs) You know, my joke about that is, you know, when you're a white sheet, uh, if you're a bright light, the mosquitoes come. Okay, (laughs) and the bugs go after the bright lights. But that's for our own soul growth, because everything that can any kind of upsetting thing that can happen to me and things are upsetting uh i process it just like that and come back to seeing okay where's my thinking off where's my behavior off why am i expecting what's not possible or expecting too much let me keep finding my balance where my heart opens again so a kind of a measure of a practical enlightenment is when you're bothered by something how quickly can you come back to reality which is everything's okay everything's okay. People are learning all the lessons they need to learn. And I know people can say, what about that child? What about all this stuff? Horrible. 
those people are not creating their reality. I'm only saying what I'm saying is true is when you're in touch with the source, when you're one with the source, then you start creating your life exactly the way that works. If you're not in source consciousness, you're like a pinball bouncing back history, family feuds, conditioning, bang, bang, right. bang, bang, bang. But so the idea of you, you create your life is anything that happens in my life, I know I created, I put something out and it came back. And so what, what's, what am I putting out that's attracting that to me? And how can I then process it? And maybe I can't change certain things in the outer world. I can lean into it. I do. Like right now, I'm trying to lean into men and women really are different. And the world's going to shit unless we learn how to have men and women love each other. It takes a man and a woman to give birth to life. If we want our life to thrive, we need to have more married couples with children. <laughs> we need to have less divorce, more understanding, more freedom to be ourselves, which is not leaving our partner because we disagree, but to find yourself in them so you can find more harmony as opposed to being offended by everything, which is just a measure of dramatically low self-esteem, which is associated with stress. I, I, I take offense at that as just a stress reaction, right? You can't have a stress reaction unless if you're a man, you've lost confidence. See, confidence produces testosterone and doing something and you're confident to the degree that you're not confident, you'll be angry or afraid, or you'll be compassive or you'll get addicted. So when men are not strong on their male side, they go to their female side and that's okay. The female side is do what you like, do what you love, do mm -hmm. what's enjoyable, sleep in, get a massage, eat, have a bowl of ice cream. Okay. Do what you like produces estrogen. And I remember again, as a teenager, I love that song. Do what you like, <laughs> do what you like, do what you like, do what you like. This was the whole culture of men going to their female side. Fortunately, I found meditation to bring me back to my male side the discipline of meditation, the, I was a bit of an extremist. I don't recommend that much for everybody, but right. everybody, you got to become extremely being you. And that's who I am. And that's part of finding myself because I had so many, I, I, so much on my female side. Okay. I have all these emotions and all these feelings. So I learned how to be a Buddha where you simply forget all your problems and you go state of peacefulness and you don't worry about this stuff. And, and you can't indulge, you know, I was more of an ascetic only eating one meal a day, which I still only eat one meal a day. Now we have science saying that's the best thing for your health is intermediate fasting, you know, only eight hours eat during that time. Uh, you, you know, the, the world has gone the wrong direction and we see the results of it. And I'm not negative about it because I know that people do not change in a positive direction until they suffer going in the direction they're going. Right. You can't pivot until it's painful. If people just don't change, we, we are just comfortable people. You know, I, I will not go to the gym unless I get fat. Okay. I will not give up ice cream unless it made me fat. And if I'm fat, it doesn't feel good to me. Okay. I want to feel nice and slim. I want to be able to do my yoga exercises and it feels really good. I also want to have my testosterone. So I'm a healthy man. I'm having great sex. You know, this is a big part of being human. And if people don't want that, that's okay. It's a, but they don't have a choice. What I do is give people, at least here's the option. I'm going to talk about it. You know, this is how you can do it. Even when we talk about sex, let me take a moment to talk about that. Is that okay, Alex? Sure, go for it. Okay. So here, we, what you have is a society which is addicted to sex. Our society is addicted to sex. Women are addicted to being looking sexy, but men are addicted to sex. And I remember a Bill Maher show I was watching and Bill Maher was laughing because, you know, one of these famous people who was cheating on his wife, he said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm a, I have a sexual addiction. I'm going to go to the clinic. And Bill made the joke. He just says, every man's addicted to sex. If you can get it, you that. get it. You know, what's the deal? Okay. So uh, having been a celibate, I understand the power of not letting your addictions control you. Having sex is doing what you like. Anything which is doing what you like is being on your female side. So what we now have is a culture of men who are addicted to all addictions is when a man has an addiction, he's doing what he likes, right? Even though it's something that's not productive for him, you know? <laughs> so if, if you can't say something's an addiction unless it has a down, you know, I, I like to make love. I like to teach. I like to write books. So I'm not addicted to those things. That's just me being what I'm here to do. Right. But if it was causing me to ignore my wife all the time, then I would be a workaholic. You know, if my life was being disrupted by my, some addiction I have. So anyway, finally, the research came out 
and it shows that when men, when men have set, when men ejaculate, say on Saturday, they did it with 25 year old athletes. You have sex on Saturday, Saturday night, and then you wait. And they had to like say, now you, I want you to stay, abstain from masturbation or having sex for six days, abstinence for six days. On the seventh day, their testosterone increased 50%. If they had sex on Saturday night and they had sex on Tuesday night, on Saturday morning, their testosterone was their baseline. If you want your baseline testosterone level to be on ascending scale for the rest of your life, one aspect of it is have sex once a week. If you didn't have sex, then you went to baseline. You didn't, go, you didn't get 50%. You have to be in the rhythm of being in a relationship, having sex, and then not ejaculating for six days on the seventh day, your testosterone will increase 50%. It, it, it's phenomenal. And mm. I had to look back and realize how did my sex life always stay there? You know, I have good communication skills and that's a big part of it. Cause you know, when a woman's not complaining about you, your testosterone goes up in her presence. If a woman's complaining about you or remembering something you did in the past, your testosterone goes down in her presence. So average men over 40, they tend to uh, lose their interest. And now they're getting charged up by looking at pornography just to get an erection. Right. This is really very, very unhealthy. Uh, so, John, where can people find your new book, Beyond Mars and Venus? Alex, this, this is if you're married and you have kids, probably you want to go to men are from Mars, women are from Venus. But if you're single or you're just starting a relationship or you're having big problems in your relationships, this is the book. It's written 25 years later, Beyond Mars and Venus. It helps men to rebuild their testosterone without having to take testosterone. You make it. And how women, how they can balance their hormones and make more estrogen and progesterone. Communication skills that will do that. One simple one. I like to always get something really practical. Please, Today's please. been a lot of theory and stories. The, your wife's talking. You say, instead of giving solutions, interrupting her, we get to the point. Just know if she talks and she feels heard, her estrogen levels will go up, her stress level will go down, and her brain will shift, will automatically pivot to looking at what's good about you. And at, at a certain point, she'll feel more sexual desire for you, all because estrogen's going up. So one of the major things to do it is how you communicate. When she's saying things that are bothering to you, try to maintain a distance from reacting. And, and so, men have to have a pivot. Where do you go to? You go to tell me more. Help me understand that better. Knowing that every time you say, help me understand that better, you're scoring points with her and her estrogen is going higher and higher. And then she's going to desire you. And that's one of the things you want. Long before that, she's going to love you more, appreciate you more because you're giving her a gift that no one can give her. All day long, she's on her male side, pushing that side of her down. So these feelings will come out. Usually they're very overreactive. They're irrational. They don't make sense at all. You could always use logic to break them down. She doesn't need you to do that. That's what you need to do. If you're upset, stop talking, listen more. And if it's still bothering you because you're losing control or you're taking everything personally, that means your estrogen's going up. You need to say, let's not talk about this now. I need to process it or I need to think about it. Go away for a while. Do something to increase your testosterone, which anything that is challenging, anything you're good at, solving problems that doesn't have a negative result later, which means don't just go watch porn. That will give your testosterone a boost, but it will just drop down again. People who watch porn, their testosterone levels go down, 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 down. And the billion dollar porn industry says it has no effect on your testosterone. Nonsense. The only research I can find that back up my point of view here, besides the fact that I'm 70 and my testosterone is 50% higher all the time, <laughs> is is you can't say that's science. I'm just giving you my experience because I don't masturbate. I don't ejaculate. And as a, you know, I also learned something is not this talk, but as a man, how you can have lots and lots of sex with somebody you love and not have to ejaculate because then you always, you have sex every day. You know, how many of my friends at 70 years old are having sex every day? <laughs> I'm, I have more time to do it. But, but I have to ask you, how does, how does the woman feel that you're not a jack? Is it, she take it personally? Does it matter uh, yeah, to her? It's a, it's a big subject. Oh no, we're both multi-orgasmic together. It's way beyond ejaculation. Women love ejaculation because it's a surge of estrogen in a man. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's when basically his body can't handle that much 
her body can't handle that much pleasure. And now your energy doesn't go into her. So attention builds up and the ejaculation is the release of tension because your estrogen level soars. So there's this feeling she gets when that happens. It's really good for her and it's, it's your orgasm. But when you can have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of orgasms with her, uh, she's on a whole nother plane of happiness and she doesn't lose desire for sex. Women lose desire for sex. And generally speaking, it's because the man loses desire for her. He ejaculates. You want to pull away. And that's natural because when you ejaculate, your estrogen goes way high. Now you need to detach. You pull away. Pulling away is actually something detaching, becoming back to yourself again. That's testosterone producing. So now your testosterone levels are going to start to go back up again. And your estrogen is going to go back down again because you're pulling away. It happens in bed. You know, you have sex, you naturally curl over the other side, you know, which is happening. Right, right. Okay. It's a hormonal shift that took place. But if you never, ever have that huge surge of estrogen more than your testosterone, you, 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 you finish having sex with a big erection, you know, it's, it's bigger than it was when it started when you're a teenager, because there's no big release of, of, of testosterone. You still have your testosterone. You still have your estrogen. Just kind of, okay, we got to get going now. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair it's, enough. See, that's a life where you're not addicted to ejaculation, the most primitive addiction that men have. Mm. And using porn is just disastrous. It creates an addiction to, I have to have it. I have to have it. And, you know, this is where we just have to use abstinence until you're in love with somebody. When you have sex with somebody you love, another hormone gets produced. Even if you ejaculate, it's called prolactin and prolactin inhibits the lustful addiction to sex and it becomes an ecstatic addiction and enjoy addiction mm -hmm. to love, so to speak. So this is all advanced training, like advanced meditation. <laughs> there's, and there's advanced sex. And this is a wonderful world of opportunities opens up lots of books on how to have orgasms about ejaculating and the women love it and the men love it, but it takes training and it takes physical exercises to do it. It's a, but right now we're talking about practical takeaways with right. men. If you're angry, apologize for it. Sorry, I'm getting upset. I need to think about this and I'll come back and I'll be more loving again. And when okay. you come back, you don't come back and talk about the same thing. And this is what I say. I'm, I jokingly say, join the John Gray cult for three months. And whenever a man starts to get angry or a woman starts to get angry, any tension building up through talking, say, let's not talk about this now. Let's do an airy fairy thing, which is to talk to talk about what we're grateful for, what we're happy about, and ignore negativity for three months, and you'll change the neurochemistry right. and and the patterning in your brain. Mm -hmm. The research shows if you do something new and different, you will grow brain chemical brain uh, connective tissue. You'll mm -hmm. grow it right then. So let's say I don't play piano. And somebody teaches me how to do three chords, and I repeat repeat them over and over and over for six hours, over and over and over. A huge part of my brain will grow. It will actually grow. Now, let's say I already know piano and you teach me some new chords, nothing happens. It's new and different. If you use your willpower, which separates us from animals, use your will to say, you know what? Arguing has never worked. So we're gonna join the cult for three months and retrain our brain and you'll come back with a greater sense of ability to not escalate. Escalation is the worst thing in relationships, the best thing in the bedroom. So I'm not, <laughs> it's our nature, but let's escalate towards the positive rather than escalate towards the negative. And if you can't just shift right into gratitude, you can say, if you're already upset, you can't go right back to positivity like that. It seems like woo woo, we're faking it. And so if it seems like woo woo, you're faking it, then let's not talk about this now. I need some time to come right. back to my true self. I need some cave time. Women, you find somebody else to go talk with. You need to talk. Women need to talk when they're upset. Talking and you're being heard actually produces estrogen, lowers her stress. Men, forget it temporarily. And then, then, when you, then when you're feeling really good, just think about that conversation and think about what a stupid guy you were. I blew it. I said this. I said shouldn't this. Shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't, shouldn't have, have done that. that. Shouldn't have said that. And just come back and here's the apology. Uh, this is, I got so many books, but let me, I'll try to stop. But as soon as you said that, this is the ultimate apology, man. You don't know how to do this. You see, you, you say, oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. And she goes, yes. Okay. <laughs> and you're kind of like, somebody's been looking down at you. Instead, you can say, I, you know, I, I realized I said this and this, I was so insensitive. I'm sorry. What guy's going to have his masculinity go down by saying I was insensitive. 
being insensitive produces masculinity, you know, <laughs> I, right. I'm a tough guy. So another one is uh, I was insensitive. You know, I said that thing or, I was, you know, I started to raise my voice. I just want to apologize because I was very insensitive. OK, so what? <laughs> and and it's, a, it's you, your energy, you know, it's a power goes down if you apologize for something that it wasn't that big of a deal. OK, if it's a big deal, apologize. But little things you can always say, you know, I was, I was so insensitive. I was a bully. Oh, I was a bull. I can see I was a bully. You know, right. <laughs> or you could say, you know, I realize that when the way I was talking to you and I raised my voice, I was so mean. Uh, I, I, I can be nicer now. I want to be nicer now. <laughs> So everything is about acknowledging your accountability with something I call adjectives, which are negative nouns to express who you are, rather than saying you're inadequate. Uh, anyway, so there's so many tools. That's in my Mars, Venus on a date book. There's so many good things there for even married couples. I, I, I mean, John, listen, you you have uh, you have helped so many men and women around the world over the last 30, 40 years at this point. Um, thank you so much for all the work that you've done. Uh, where can people go to find out more about your work? Okay, your thanks. Books? Thank you for that, Alex. Uh, what they can do, well, this is a wonderful book, Beyond Mars and Venus, it is on tape, so you can listen to it in your car, whatever. The Mars Venus, two words, marsvenus.com is my website. And I have free classes there, free blogs. You go over this stuff. It's We need repetition again and again. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have a little note on, still on my refrigerator that says, <laughs> Don't solve her problem. <laughs> another one I have is another one I have is don't speak. Just don't speak. <laughs> and it's it, and of course women want to say, okay, what's going on inside? And then as soon as you speak, why would you say that? Well, how could you say that? And then the argument starts. So as soon as there's some tension, go into all right. Let's not talk about that now. Let's just focus on the positive and. Uh, appreciate that's another one something i appreciate about you something i'm mm-hmm. grateful for something i'm proud of just shift the brain retrain your brain to not always go to the negative and that's where it escalates come back to the positive so uh, thanks so much I, for I, inviting I, me on your show alex it's a real pleasure talking with you and thank you so much for all the good work you've done over the years my friend i truly truly appreciate it and thank you for being on the show continued success and continued health sir thank you